This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, April 5, 1907, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 15, by Mark Twain. Dictated October 8, 1906. From Susie's Biography of Me. Papa says that if the cholera comes here, he will take sour mash to the mountains. This remark about the cat is followed by various entries covering a month in which Jean, General Grant, the sculptor Gerhardt, Mrs. Candace Wheeler, Miss Dora Wheeler, Mr. Frank Stockton, Mr. Mary Mapes Dodge, and the widow of General Custer appear and drift in procession across the page, then vanish forever from the biography. Then Susie drops this remark in the wake of the vanished procession. Sour Mash is a constant source of anxiety, care, and pleasure to Papa. I did in truth think a great deal of that old tortoise-shell harlot, but I haven't a doubt that in order to impress Susie I was pretending agonies of solicitude which I didn't honestly feel. Sour Mash never gave me any real anxiety. She was always able to take care of herself, and she was ostentatiously vain of the fact, vain of it to a degree which often made me ashamed of her, much as I esteemed her. Many persons would like to have the society of cats during the summer vacation in the country, but they deny themselves this pleasure, because they think they must either take the cats along when they return to the city, where they would be a trouble and an encumbrance, or leave them in the country, houseless and homeless. These people have no ingenuity, no invention, no wisdom. Or it would occur to them to do as I do, rent cats by the month for the summer, and return them to their good homes at the end of it. Early last May I rented a kitten of a farmer's wife by the month. Then I got a discount by taking three. They have been good company for about five months now, and are still kittens. At least, they have not grown much, and to all intents and purposes are still kittens, and as full of romping energy and enthusiasm as they were in the beginning. This is remarkable. I am an expert in cats, but I have not seen a kitten keep its kittenhood nearly so long before. These are beautiful creatures, these triplets. Two of them wear the blackest and shiniest and thickest of seal-skin vestments all over their bodies, except the lower half of their faces and the terminations of their paws. The black masks reach down below the eyes, therefore when the eyes are closed they are not visible. The rest of the face and the gloves and stockings are snow-white. These markings are just the same on both cats, so exactly the same that when you call one the other is likely to answer, because they cannot tell each other apart. Since the cats are precisely alike and can't be told apart by any of us, they do not need two names, so they have but one between them. We call both of them sackcloth, and we call the gray one ashes. I believe I have never seen such intelligent cats as these before. They are full of the nicest discriminations. When I read German aloud, they weep. You can see the tears run down. It shows what pathos there is in the German tongue. I had not noticed before that all German is pathetic, no matter what the subject is or how it is treated. It was these humble observers that brought the knowledge to me. I have tried all kinds of German on these cats, romance, poetry, philosophy, theology, market reports, and the result has always been the same. The cats sob and let the tears run down, which shows that all German is pathetic. French is not a familiar tongue to me, and the pronunciation is difficult, and comes out of me encumbered with a Missouri accent. But the cats like it and when I make impassioned speeches in that language they sit in a row and put up their paws, palm to palm, and frantically give thanks. Hardly any cats are affected by music, but these are. When I sing, they go reverently away, showing how deeply they feel it. Sour Mash never cared for these things. She had many noble qualities, but at bottom she was not refined, and cared little or nothing for theology and the arts. It is a pity to say it, but these cats are not above the grade of human beings, for I know by certain signs that they are not sincere in their exhibitions of emotion, but exhibit them merely to show off and attract attention, conduct which is distinctly human, yet with a difference. 
They do not know enough to conceal their desire to show off, but the grown human being does. What is ambition? It is only the desire to be conspicuous. The desire for fame is only the desire to be continuously conspicuous, and attract attention and be talked about. These cats are like human beings in another way. When Ashes began to work his fictitious emotions and show off, the other members of the firm followed suit, in order to be in the fashion. That is the way with human beings. They are afraid to be outside. Whatever the fashion happens to be, they conform to it, whether it be a pleasant fashion or the reverse, they lacking the courage to ignore it and go their own way. All human beings would like to dress in loose and comfortable and highly colored and showy garments, and they had their desire until a century ago, when a king, or some other influential ass, introduced somber hues and discomfort and ugly designs into masculine clothing. The meek public surrendered to the outrage, and by consequence we are in that odious captivity today, and are likely to remain in it for a long time to come. Fortunately, the women were not included in the disaster, and so their graces and their beauty still have the enhancing help of delicate fabrics and varied and beautiful colors. Their clothing makes a great opera audience an enchanting spectacle, a delight to the eye and the spirit, a garden of Eden for charm and color. The men, clothed in dismal black, are scattered here and there and everywhere over the garden, like so many charred stumps and they damage the effect, but cannot annihilate it. In summer we poor creatures have a respite, and may clothe ourselves in white garments, loose, soft, and in some degree shapely. But in the winter, the somber winter, the depressing winter, the cheerless winter, when white clothes and bright colors are especially needed to brighten our spirits and lift them up, we all conform to the prevailing insanity and go about in dreary black each man doing it because the others do it, and not because he wants to. They are really no sincerer than sackcloth and ashes. At bottom the sackcloths do not care to exhibit their emotions when I am performing before them. They only do it because ashes started it. I would like to dress in a loose and flowing costume made all of silks and velvets, resplendent with all the stunning dyes of the rainbow, and so would every sane man I have ever known but none of us dares to venture it. There is such a thing as carrying conspicuousness to the point of discomfort, and if I should appear on Fifth Avenue on a Sunday morning at church time clothed as I would like to be clothed, the churches would be vacant, and I should have all the congregations tagging after me to look and secretly envy and publicly scoff. It is the way human beings are made. They are always keeping their real feelings shut up inside, and publicly exploiting their fictitious ones. Next, after fine colors, I like plain white. One of my sorrows, when the summer ends, is that I must put off my cheery and comfortable white clothes and enter for the winter into depressing captivity of the shapeless and degrading black ones. It is mid-October now, and the weather is growing cold up here in the New Hampshire hills, but it will not succeed in freezing me out of these white garments, for here the neighbors are few, and it is only of crowds that I am afraid. I made a brave experiment the other night to see how it would feel to shock a crowd with these unseasonable clothes, and also to see how long it might take the crowd to reconcile itself to them and stop looking astonished and outraged. On a stormy evening I made a talk before a full house in the village closed like a ghost, and looking as conspicuously all solitary and alone on that platform as any ghost could have looked and I found, to my gratification, that it took the house less than ten minutes to forget about the ghost and give its attention to the tidings I had brought. I am nearly seventy-one, and I recognize that my age has given me a good many privileges, valuable privileges, privileges which are not granted to younger persons. Little by little I hope to get together courage enough to wear white clothes all through the winter in New York, it will be a great satisfaction to me to show off in this way, and perhaps the largest of all satisfactions will be the knowledge that every scoffer of my sex will secretly envy me and wish he dared to follow my lead. That mention that I have acquired new and great privileges by grace of my age is not an uncalculated remark. When I passed the seventieth milestone ten months ago, 
I instantly realized that I had entered a new country and a new atmosphere. To all the public I was become recognizably old, undeniably old, and from that moment everybody assumed a new attitude toward me, the reverent attitude granted by custom to age, and straightway the stream of generous new privileges began to flow in upon me and refresh my life. Since then I have lived an ideal existence, and I now believe what Choate said last March, and which at the time I didn't credit, that the best of life begins at seventy, for then your work is done, you know that you have done your best, let the quality of the work be what it may, that you have earned your holiday, a holiday of peace and contentment, and that thenceforth, to the setting of your sun, nothing will break it, nothing interrupt it. Dictated January 22, 1907. In an earlier chapter I inserted some verses beginning, Love Came at Dawn, which had been found among Susie's papers after her death. I was not able to say that they were hers, but I judged that they might be, for the reason that she had not enclosed them in quotation marks according to her habit when storing up treasures gathered from other people. Stedman was not able to determine the authorship for me, as the verses were new to him, but the authorship has now been traced. The verses were written by William Wilford Campbell, a Canadian poet, and they form a part of the contents of his book called Beyond the Hills of Dream. The authorship of the beautiful lines which my wife and I inscribed upon Susie's gravestone was untraceable for a time. We had found them in a book in India, and had lost the book, and with it the author's name. But in time an application to the editor of Notes and Queries furnished me the author's name. Note, Robert Richardson, deceased, of Australia and it has been added to the verses upon the gravestone. Last night, at a dinner-party where I was present, Mr. Peter Dunn Dooley handed to the host several dollars in satisfaction of a lost bet. I seemed to see an opportunity to better my condition, and I invited Dooley, apparently disinterestedly, to come to my house Friday and play billiards. He accepted, and I judged that there is going to be a deficit in the Dooley treasury as a result. In great qualities of the heart and brain, Dooley is gifted beyond all propriety. He is brilliant. He is an expert with his pen. And he easily stands at the head of all the satirists of his generation. But he is going to walk in darkness Friday afternoon. It will be a fraternal kindness to teach him that, with all his light and culture, he does not know all the valuable things and it will also be a fraternal kindness to him to complete his education for him, and I shall do this on Friday, and send him home in that perfected condition. I possess a billiard secret which can be valuable to the Dooley sept, after I shall have conferred it upon Dooley, for a consideration. It is a discovery which I made by accident thirty-eight years ago in my father-in-law's house in Elmira. There was a scarred and battered and ancient billiard table in the garret, and along with it a peck of checked and chipped balls, and a rack full of crooked and headless cues. I played solitaire up there every day with that difficult outfit. The table was not level, but slanted sharply to the southeast. There wasn't a ball that was round, or would complete the journey you started it on, but would always get tired and stop halfway and settle with a jolty wobble to a standstill on its chipped side. I tried making counts with four balls, but found it difficult and discouraging. So I added a fifth ball, then a sixth, and then a seventh, and kept on adding until at last I had twelve balls on the table and a thirteenth to play with. My game was caroms, caroms solely, caroms plain or caroms with cushion to help, anything that could furnish a count. In the course of time I found to my astonishment that I was never able to run fifteen under any circumstances. By huddling the balls advantageously in the beginning, I could now and then coax fourteen out of them, but I couldn't reach fifteen by either luck or skill. Sometimes the balls would get scattered into difficult positions and defeat me in that way. Sometimes, if I managed to keep them together, I would freeze, and always, when I froze, and had to play away from the contact, there was sure to be nothing to play at but a wide and uninhabited vacancy. One day Mr. Dalton called on my brother-in-law on a matter of business, and I was asked if I could entertain him a while, until my brother-in-law should finish an engagement with another gentleman. I said I could, and took him up to the billiard table. 
I had played with him many times at the club, and knew that he could play billiards tolerably well, only tolerably well, but not any better than I could. He and I were just a match. He didn't know our table, he didn't know those balls, he didn't know those warped and headless cues. He didn't know the southeastward slant of the table and how to allow for it. I judged it would be safe and profitable to offer him a bet on my scheme. I emptied the avalanche of thirteen balls on the table and said, "'Take a ball and begin, Mr. Dalton. How many can you run with an outlay like that?' He said, with the half-affronted air of a mathematician who has been asked how much of the multiplication table he can recite without a break, "'I suppose a million eight hundred thousand, anyway.' I said, "'You shall have the privilege of placing the balls to suit yourself, and I want to bet you a dollar that you can't run fifteen. I will not dwell upon the sequel. At the end of an hour his face was red and wet with perspiration. His outer garments lay scattered here and there over the place. He was the angriest man in the state, and there wasn't a rag or remnant of an injurious adjective left in him anywhere, and I had all his small change. When the summer was over we went home to Hartford, and one day Mr. George Robertson arrived from Boston with two or three hours to spare between then and the return train, and as he was a young gentleman to whom we were in debt for much social pleasure, it was my duty, and a welcome duty, to make his two or three hours interesting for him. So I took him upstairs and set up my billiard scheme for his comfort. Mine was a good table, in perfect repair, the cues were in perfect condition, the balls were ivory and flawless. But I knew that Mr. Robertson was my prey, just the same, for by exhaustive tests with this outfit I had found that my limit was thirty-one. I had proved to my satisfaction that whereas I could not fairly expect to get more than six or eight or a dozen caroms out of a run, I could now and then reach twenty and twenty-five, and after a long procession of failures finally achieve a run of thirty-one. But in no case had I ever got beyond thirty-one. Robertson's game, as I knew, was a little better than mine, so I resolved to require him to make thirty-two. I believed it would entertain him. He was one of these brisk and hearty and cheery and self-satisfied young fellows who are brimful of confidence and who plunge with grateful eagerness into any enterprise that offers a showy test of their abilities. I emptied the balls on the table and said, "'Take a cue and a ball, George, and begin. How many caroms do you think you can make out of that layout?' He laughed the laugh of the gay and the carefree, as became his youth and inexperience, and said, I can punch caroms out of that bunch a week without a break. I said, Place the balls to suit yourself and begin. Confidence is a necessary thing in billiards, but overconfidence is bad. George went at his task with much too much lightsomeness of spirit and disrespect for the situation. On his first shot he scored three caroms, on his second shot he scored four caroms, and on his third shot he missed as simple a caram as could be devised. He was very much astonished, and said he would not have supposed that careful play could be needed with an acre of bunched balls in front of a person. He began again, and played more carefully, but still with too much lightsomeness. He couldn't seem to learn to take the situation seriously. He made about a dozen caroms and broke down. He was irritated with himself now, and he thought he caught me laughing. He didn't. I do not laugh publicly at my client when this game is going on. I only do it inside, or save it for after the exhibition is over. But he thought he had caught me laughing, and it increased his irritation. Of course I knew he thought I was laughing privately, for I was experienced. They all think that, and it has a good effect. It sharpens their annoyance and debilitates their play. He made another trial and failed. Once more he was astonished. Once more he was humiliated and as for his anger it rose to summer heat. He arranged the balls again, grouping them carefully, and said he would win this time, or die. When a client reaches this condition, it is a good time to damage his nerve further, and this can always be done by saying some little mocking thing or other that has the outside appearance of a friendly remark, so I employed this art. I suggested that a bet might tauten his nerves, and that I would offer one, but that as I did not want it to be an expense to him, but only a help, I would make it small, 
a cigar, if he were willing, a cigar that he would fail again, not an expensive one, but a cheap native one of the crown-jewel breed, such as is manufactured in Hartford for the clergy. It set him afire all over. I could see the blue flame issue from his eyes. He said, "'Make it a hundred, and no Connecticut cabbage-leaf product, but Havana, twenty-five dollars the box.' I took him up but I said I was sorry to see him do this, because it did not seem to me right or fair for me to rob him under our own roof when he had been so kind to us. He said with energy and acrimony, You take care of your own pocket, if you'll be so good, and leave me to take care of mine. And he plunged at the Congress of Balls with a vindictiveness which was infinitely contenting to me. He scored a failure and began to undress. I knew it would come to that, for he was in the condition now that Mr. Dooley will be in at about that stage of the contest on Friday afternoon. A clothes-rack will be provided for Mr. Dooley to hang his things on as fast as he shall from time to time shed them. George raised his voice four degrees and flung out the challenge. Double or quits? Done, I responded in the gentle and compassionate voice of one who is apparently getting sorrier and sorrier. There was an hour and a half of straight disaster after that, and if it was a sin to enjoy it, it is no matter. I did enjoy it. It is half a lifetime ago, but I enjoy it yet, every time I think of it. George made failure after failure. His fury increased with each failure as he scored it. With each defeat he flung off one or another rag of his raiment, and every time he started on a fresh inning he made it double or quits once more. Twice he reached thirty and broke down. Once he reached thirty-one and broke down. These nears made him frantic, and I believe I was never so happy in my life, except the time a few years later when the Rev. J. H. Twitchell and I walked to Boston, and he had the celebrated conversation with the hosteler at the inn at Ashford, Connecticut. At last, when we were notified that Patrick was at the door to drive him to his train, George owed me five thousand cigars at twenty-five cents apiece, and I was so sorry I could have hugged him. But he shouted, "'Give me ten minutes more,' and added stormily, "'It's double or quits again, and I'll win out free of debt or owe you ten thousand cigars, and you'll pay the funeral expenses.' He began on his final effort, and I believe that in all my experience among both amateurs and experts I have never seen a cue so carefully handled in my lifetime as George handled his upon this intensely interesting occasion. He got safely up to twenty-five, and then ceased to breathe. So did I. He labored along, and added a point, another point, still another point, and finally reached thirty-one. He stopped there, and we took a breath. By this time the balls were scattered all down the cushions, about a foot or two apart, and there wasn't a shot in sight anywhere that any man might hope to make. In a burst of anger and confessed defeat, he sent his ball flying around the table at random, and it crotched a ball that was packed against the cushion and sprang across to a ball against the bank on the opposite side, and counted. His luck had set him free, and he didn't owe me anything. He had used up all his spare time, but we carried his clothes to the carriage, and he dressed on his way to the station, greatly wondered at and admired by the ladies as he drove along. But he got his train. I am very fond of Mr. Dooley, and shall await his coming with affectionate and pecuniary interest. P.S. Saturday. He has been here. Let us not talk about it. Mark Twain. To be continued.